Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Or well, those of you that could get drawn away from your lunch for 10 minutes. Thank you for coming. Look at the size of that screen. It's fantastic, isn't it? I'm James. I'm from ThoughtWorks. Thank you all for coming. Um, I won't spend too much time on these slides. That's a marketing slide from ThoughtWorks. And there's some books that people from ThoughtWorks have written. You might have read some of them. So, what am I going to talk about today? The A to Z of driven development and what drives your development. So, where did this all come about? So, last year, I was working in a place in the UK called Darlington, which, if you've never been there, I thoroughly recommend you never go. And the thing about Darlington, here's the fantastic people I worked with. Um, I might be wearing that same T-shirt right now, in fact. Um, it's, there's nothing to do. And one day we were at work, and we got to talking about some of the dysfunctional things that happen in your, in your working life. It started off with test-driven development, which is by no means dysfunctional. But then we started talking about stuff like sales-driven development and marketing-driven development and all sorts of weird things like that that we've all been involved in. And we started sort of, I started writing them down or noting them down mentally at work that day. And then throughout the day, the conversation went on and a rule developed, which was, you know what? Anything goes as long as you've actually experienced it during your life somewhere. So you couldn't just make stuff up. And then we went, uh, we went to the pub that night and I refused to let us go in. I think it was somebody's birthday. We had a table booked in the restaurant and I sat down in there with my laptop and I said, we're not sitting down to, the, to our food until we have finished an A to Z. We want something from A through to Z. I apologize for the Latin language, by the way, and the alphabet. I, I don't have a Polish alphabet version, unfortunately. So I put it on my blog. There it is. And then I shared it with ThoughtWorks, and it started this massive sort of thread of extra suggestions, and then it did a follow-up. And then somebody said to me, you should talk about that at a conference, because everybody would have done some of this stuff. So I was like, well, OK, maybe. So, oops. And that's where it came from. So, this is the A to Z of driven development. So, A stands for AWS development. AWS driven development. This is when you can do anything you like as long as there is an AWS tool for it. So, you can use a database and RDS, but it has to be one of the ones they've got. Everything else goes. Uh, Kafka you can use now because now there is a version of Kafka on AWS. And, of course, you can use Kubernetes because there's EKS. But you can't use anything else. Of course, that does lead to massive vendor lock-in, which is quite dysfunctional. Behavior-driven development's a thing. Also, there's bleeding-edge development. Now, this is where you refuse to use anything unless it's barely out of beta. Also, if there's ever been a conference about this thing, you can't use it, unless it was an unconference. That's just about allowed. B also stands for that great English phrase, bullshit-driven development. I'm sure we've all been here. This is where some developer in your team says, oh, yeah, this is the right technology. I know how to use this technology. Yeah, I've used it before. I've used it on a project before. So you start using this thing. Three months later, you're realizing, hmm, that guy was a bit of a bullshitter. He doesn't know the first thing about this technology. Six months later, that person's left the company, so you've got even less knowledge about it, and now your project is forever down the pan because of bullshit-driven development. C, this stands for career-driven development. Who in this room has ever chosen to use a technology because it's going to advance their career? I'm sure we've all done that from time to time. And its closely related cousin is CV-driven development. CV is the English word for a resume. Uh, so CV-driven development is the same as career-driven development, but you're doing it expressly to leave that company. D, domain-driven development, that's a thing. But it's also developer-driven development. This is when developer experience starts to take over. All your devs are so annoyed with the rubbish technology you're using that you let them decide what to do. Now, the best example of this I've seen is on a client I worked for a couple of years ago. They decided to try and keep their devs interested. They were going to do every single new service in Clojure. They weren't going to use Java anymore. So all the devs were really happy. A year later, they had this sort of hybrid code base of Java and uh, Clojure, which was pretty confusing. A load of the devs realized they could get paid 20 grand more as closure devs, so they left. But then the company found that they couldn't hire devs anymore because it was a, a British government agency and they have a, a ceiling to how much they're allowed to pay developers and they couldn't afford to hire closure developers. They actually had some of them back in as consultants. <laughs> it was great. E is for ego driven development. This is what rock stars do. We don't like that. Who's heard of Martin Fowler? Has anybody heard of EastEnders in England? 
Probably not, because there's no British. Well, one person has. That's Martin Fowler from EastEnders. <laughs> this joke only works in the UK. I apologize. Of course, I'm talking about this Martin Fowler. So Fowler-driven development is when you only do stuff that has been effectively authorized on Martin Fowler's blog. You get extra points if you phone a friend of yours from ThoughtWorks and say, hey, I've just read Martin Fowler's blog. What does he mean by this and this and this? And it's like, oh, right, yeah, Martin spoke to me about that, sure. And it also stands for failure-driven development. This is the game of whack-a-mole that we used to play, and I hope nobody does anymore, where you fix this defect here, you roll it out, this defect pops up, you whack that failure there, this, this de they all keep popping up, and all you ever do is fix all these failures. G, Google-driven development, pretty much the same as AWS-driven development, but you're using Google Cloud. H, so I hope people do hypothesis-driven development, because that's a good thing. But it also stands for hype-driven development, which is only the next big thing. Repeat offenders in this space would be microservices, Kafka. Kafka's a repeat offender in a lot of spaces, actually. Developer-driven development, particularly. Only the next big thing, of course. It also stands for hippo. Is this just an English phrase? I don't know if it's a phrase in other languages, but in English, hippo stands for the highest paid person's opinion. And the hippo is that highest paid person. Hippo-driven development is when you have a meeting with about 20 people in the room. Everybody gives their opinion, and then the hippo decides what to do. Even if she's outvoted 1 to 20, she decides what to do. I and J go together. They are IntelliJ-driven development. This is when you join a new project and you go through the code base and you keep getting all these suggestions that IntelliJ throws up because everybody else has suppressed these warnings long ago and you're getting them and you're going through. It's also known as Alt-J driven. No, Alt-Enter, isn't it, IntelliJ? Or it used to be anyway, I don't know if it still is. Uh, and then you've got J, which is basically JetBrains driven development, which is exactly the same thing. K stands for KISS, we'll keep that one simple. And it also stands for kangaroo-driven development. This is a dysfunction that we often see in uh, weak product owners. The product owner says, this is the most important thing. Then sometime later, um, probably the same day even, comes along and says, no, no, this is now the most important thing, because this product owner can't control all the stakeholders above them and has no idea and no strength. I thought that was a bit weak when we wrote this blog post, but one of uh, two people phoned me up and said, God, that's what we do here. So it must be a real thing. <laughs> L, this is representing lifestyle-driven development. This is when your team spends hours and hours and days and weeks arguing over whether there should be a three-space indent or a four-space indent. I don't care. <laughs> and I don't know why people care. That, to me, is a lifestyle-driven development. Tiny things that mean nothing to us. M, well, this is Moscow-driven development. That's a good thing. N, you might know, the, this is negativity-driven development, where you spend so much time being negative about the bad things that can happen. You write tons and tons of tests and everything, and, so, and it's a perfect gold-plated, bulletproof code base, but you run out of budget before it goes live. O, to totally the opposite, optimism-driven development. You know that nothing's going to go wrong. You write perfect code. So you get that whole thing out there really quickly, then it falls on its ass and nobody uses the product because it's crap. P, Patterns-driven development. Who's ever worked with somebody who refuses to do anything until you've had a two-week discussion about what pattern to use, and this person incessantly goes through all the code saying, this is no good because it doesn't follow a pattern from the book? My God. And then you've got politics-driven development. Happens in big companies everywhere. I pity you if you're in that place. Q is QA-driven development. It's definitely a thing, but wherever I looked on the internet, it called it tester-driven development, and I already had stuff for T, so we called it QA-driven development. Oh, well, this is ReSharper. It's basically the .NET version of INJ. Stack Overflow driven development. Who's ever seen a comment in a code base that, after a line of code that says, I don't know what this line of code does, but if I take it out, it breaks, and this is what it was like in Stack Overflow. <laughs> Sales-driven development happens a lot in startups where the salesman comes in and says, I've sold this. We can do this, right? <laughs> TDD, we know TDD. You, underpants-driven development. You know when you have a distributed team and one person never shows their actual face in the, in the stand-up call. That person's still in their pants. 
Value-driven development's a good thing. Waterfall-driven development, I do hope nobody ever still does that. But even worse than that is Wagile, where you're pretending to be agile, but you're really still doing waterfall. This is XD-driven development, which is great. Why? Well, you ain't going to need that one. And Z is zealot-driven development, which is like when I did this blog post and wouldn't refuse to let anybody eat until we'd done it. So what's the point of all this? What should really drive your development? This was the question we were asking ourselves. So I listed out all of the stuff on the original blog post. These get quicker, by the way, <laughs> so we won't be here all day. And there they are. And I thought, what's a sensible categorization? So the first obvious one to me was, well, some of them are good ideas and some of them are bad ideas. You won't be able to read all these. Doesn't matter. There they are. So some of them are good ideas, some of them are bad ideas. OK, that's open to a little bit of interpretation, but we generally agreed. And then I said, OK, what's the stuff that is actually, you know, people have written papers and talked about, and what's the stuff that is just us joking about dysfunction? So, you know, real things that you can Google versus made up stuff. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a very strong correlation between these two here. Furthermore, we then said, OK, let's split it into how to build stuff, what stuff to build, and then there's a sort of outlier, which is tools and technology-related stuff. So that, now let's see what happens to that correlation, and you're going to have to take my word for it, but you can see the slides back later. So we looked at all this, and the tools and technology stuff, we said, OK, let's just throw that away and look at the how to build and the what to build. And we made a correlation between these and the good ideas and the stupid ideas. What did we find? Well, so if we take the stupid things out of the top box, we lose four things, so most of them stay. If we take the good ideas out of the bottom box, we only lose two things. So you can see there's a very good correlation between how to build stuff being a good idea and what stuff to build being something stupid. So what does this mean? Well, of course, I have to... OK, there's a summary of that. <laughs> I, I think I was playing with Google Slides transitions that day. Loads of sensible ideas about how to build, loads of stupid ideas about what to build. Why? Well. Here's my hypothesis. I have to come up with a hypothesis to stand on stage and, and do this sort of stuff. So why might that be? Well, here's my hypothesis. Software developers across the years have come up with all these good ideas about how to build. We came up with TDD. We came up with BDD. We came up with most of those things about how to build software. We know what we're doing. We're the ones that should be trusted to do that. On the other hand, the ownership of what to build is, not only has it changed down the years, it's always unclear. It's different in every company you work, in every environment you go to. And sometimes it's a constant battle. Sometimes it's not clear in that environment. So there is a lot of confusion about what we should build. And that's where all these dysfunctional things come from. So that's my hypothesis. So how should we decide what to build? Well, here's my thesis, number one. Arrange your teams around customer-facing outcomes. This is a bit like saying, here's a reverse Conway maneuver. Number two, decouple the teams, right? Don't spend a load of time deciding how to deal with coupling. Get rid of coupling. Number three, get a decent product owner. Simple. Number four, the product owner, in my mind, all that product owner needs to do to tell me as a technical leader is, this is the most important thing to do now. And then we'll do it. And then part six, go back to four, job done. Thank you for listening.